So welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the invited speaker of the second day of IFM, Edward Lee. Edward is a Robert S. Pepper Distinguished Professor at UC Berkeley, uh, where he has been in the um, Department of uh, Ethical Engineering and Computer Science as faculty since the 1980s. His research targets uh, cyber physical systems in a very broad sense, and essentially it uh, defines the modern combination of control theory and formal method. Uh, the impact of his work has been uh, very broad and not limited to just uh, pure research. In fact, uh, his group, uh, uh, among other things, has led the development of widely known uh, open source software projects. So for example, the best known is probably Project Ptolemy. Uh, he has also been an influential educator, recognized by several awards, awards such as the uh, Terman Award for Engineering Education, and uh, recently has also published a popular science book titled Plato and the Nerd, which gives uh, an optimistic perspective on the impact of technology on our lives. Uh, today is going to talk about uh, how the fundamental concept of state in distributed and parallel systems depend on the observer, and how determinism affects the picture. So, Edward, welcome again to IFM, and we very much uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, I, I wish I could be there in Lugano with you, um, maybe next year when, uh, uh, or the year after that, but uh, that's the way things are these days. So the focus of my talk today is probably going to surprise some of you because I'm taking aim at a core concept that underlies a lot of the verification that we do, which is the notion of state. Often verification problems begin with an automaton or a transition system without really questioning where those come from and what is the foundational meaning of the states of the system. Um, we just take that as a starting point for our models. And I'm gonna show that if you don't put some thought into what you mean by the state of the system, you could find that the same system is safe or unsafe, uh, depending on how you define state. And you can find that um, the same system is easy to verify or hard to verify in terms of uh, you know the state space explosion problem, uh, again, depending on how you define state. And I'm going to show that it's impossible to define state without also defining an observer. So uh, let's get right to it. And first of all, I want to clarify that I'm not talking about these kinds of states. Uh, but I'm talking about the state of these states. So I'll use a capital S for a state like Georgia. And I'll use the US election to talk about a state transition system. Um, it's been kind of entertaining to watch it uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. So let's focus on the state of Georgia. Uh, the state of Georgia, as you may know, was uh, one that uh, uh, has been extremely close. Uh, there's still recounts going on. Uh, the state of the state has switched from red to blue and back a few times. And I think as uh, formal verification people, we know how to model this. Um, it's, uh, it's a very simple automaton with uh, two states. The state is either red or blue. Of course, you could refine this quite a bit because actually each precinct within the state of Georgia um, reports its return separately and each precinct will be uh, will be red or blue and switching between red and blue. So you can imagine there could be immediately a state space explosion problem here. But nevertheless, the idea is that we construct some model uh, that represents these uh, transitions between red and blue. Now, the first thing that I'd like to point out is that this is not as simple as it seems, okay? Uh, the, the state of the state actually depends on the observer. And um, this is sort of a little bit whimsical at this level, but it's actually, the concept is actually very foundational. So let's ask what Albert Einstein would tell us about this. Well, one observation is that the state of the state, whether it's red or blue, depends on uh, the order in which ballots are counted in each of the precincts. So, but the order in which ballots are counted and the order in which ballots arrive depends on the observer. Uh, this is a consequence of, of uh, relativity. So there is no very clear foundational definition here if you've got physically separated events that are tr triggering state transitions. So a ballot gets counted in one precinct, a ballot gets counted in another, in another precinct, and the order in which those counts occur um, depends on the observer. 
So that's a, that's a really foundational problem, but it turns out that it's not just relativity and it's not just physically separated events. It's also even localized events uh, don't have a well-defined notion of state in the underlying physics. So Erwin Schrodinger would tell us that a, a ballot has, uh, has votes for both Biden and Trump until it's observed. Um, this is like Schrodinger's cat being dead and alive. It's a superposition of two states, okay? This is a consequence uh, or an interpretation of uh, quantum physics. Um, Heisenberg would tell us that uh, if you know where the ballots are, then you, do, you can't tell how quickly they're moving through the mail, okay? Um, John Stuart Bell is actually perhaps the most, uh, the most profound um, attacker of the notion of state, in a sense, uh, from the quantum physics uh, perspective. So, so Bell's theorem tells us that if quantum physics is an accurate model of the physical world, which is very well, well verified experimentally, um, then you can't have what physicists call both locality and reality. So by reality, what they mean, my interpretation of what a physicist means by reality in this case, is that a physical system has a well-defined notion of state, okay? It's, it's, got a, it's got properties that will determine how it responds to experimental measurement. That's what they call reality. And if you have reality, you cannot have locality, which means that what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, action at faster than the speed of light is possible. So there's a fundamental contradiction between locality and reality. I'm personally unwilling to give up uh, locality. And so I have to give up reality, which means that the state of a physical system is actually not well defined. So um, quantum physics leaves us with no basis really foundationally for defining state. And of course that opens the door for um, some people to simply deny reality. So what, what really is state, okay? The notion of state has no solid foundation in physics. And yet we depend on it critically for almost all formal verification. Does this matter? You know, should we trust our verification results? Maybe, maybe it's really not that big a deal. I mean, you know, if you're trying to verify um, a typical cyber physical system, you're not, you don't usually have components that are traveling at any significant fraction of the speed of light. So maybe, uh, maybe relativity doesn't kick in and you're dealing with macroscopic objects so that, um, you know, quantum physics doesn't really kick in and you can just use the, the, the classical notions of state. So as used in engineering, there's really two families of classical notions, the, the, continuously evolving states of Isaac Newton. So this is a differential equation here is simply uh, F equals MA written as, a, as an integral equation. And a key thing to notice is this variable T, which is the evolution of time in a continuum, which is in Newton's model, uniform across all space. So T is equal at uh, disparate positions in space and somehow shared across space. And we know this, of course, is not a very accurate model of the physical world, except at, at very macroscopic scales and uh, when things are relatively stationary. But it's a very useful notion, of course. And so x is uh, a function of this continuum. It's typically a vector, and that defines the state of your system at an instant in time. In the verification community, we tend to work more with discrete models where the state is um, often represented with these bubble and arc diagrams. The bubbles are the states and the transitions are, are movement between states. And the essential difference between these two is first of all, that the set of states is at least countable, um, usually finite. Uh, and the second one is that the transitions between states are discrete rather than continuous. Uh, but you can apply formal verification methods, of course, to either of these two models of, of state. So the question is, are these models good enough? Given that there's no foundational notion in physics for this notion of state, is this, are these enough to really be able to give us confidence in our uh, system designs? 
So let's focus on a very simple cyber physical system. And this is one that I, uh, I studied uh, together with, uh, with Marjan Sirjani, who I think uh, chaired a session just, uh, just a little while ago. Um, and uh, she led a paper that we wrote together on this and where we looked at this example in some detail. It's a very, very simple example, it's a train door, okay? And we'd like to verify that the state of the door is never open while the train is moving. So there's a simple temporal logic formula that we can describe, okay? Now, uh, the question is, you know, how are we gonna implement this system and how are we gonna verify that property? Well, here is a, uh, a program. It's actually a fairly complete program for this distributed train door example. It's got uh, some logic missing, so you can see some dot, dot, dots in here, but it's written in a programming language that I'm working on with a with an extremely talented group of people uh, across the world um, in uh, in Dresden and Kiel in Germany and uh, and in in uh, Dallas in Texas and and in Berkeley. That's uh, oh uh, yeah, that's where the main contributors are, and. Uh, this language is designed to be able to give more analyzable, more deterministic distributed real-time systems. So the train door example consists in this case of three components, a controller, a door component, and a, and a train component. And these are meant to be uh, representative of the physical realization of these systems. So the controller would be a piece of software that runs in a computer in the cockpit of the train. Uh, the door controller is a microprocessor that manages the opening and the closing of the door and, and reads the sensor data from the door and reacts to it. And the train controller is simply the, the drivetrain, okay, for, for, for the train. It's what actually controls uh, the, the, the wheels and the clutches and so forth. Okay, so this is a distributed system with several microcontrollers communicating over networks. And we would like to verify that we have this particular safety property. So the question is, what is the state of this system? Well, a first naive answer is the state is the value of the, ver the state variables in the software. So we have a train component that has a state variable that is a Boolean called moving that is either true or false. Okay, so we're not even going to model speed of the train or anything like that in this simple example. Just the train is moving or the train is not moving. Similarly, the door component has uh, a locked uh, um, variable that is its state variable. And um, we would simply like to verify that there's, uh, that our temporal logic formula is always satisfied for the state of these two variables. But when? These two state variables are changing on two physically separated microcontrollers it connected over the network. And we could naively say perhaps that, well, we would like to look at them at an instant in time, but we don't have access to an instant in time. That Newtonian model of time is not only incorrect physics, but it's also inaccessible in practical realizations. There's no way to have two physically separated microprocessors that share a notion of an instant in time at which they can examine their state variables. And so we don't have any mechanism for observing the instantaneous value of these two variables and consequently verifying that they have this property in some fictional model of time doesn't seem to be all that useful. And the fact is that the order in which events occur depends on the observer. And consequently, um, we can't really have a notion of simultaneity of these transitions, uh, at least not grounded in the physics. And so the question is, how do we, in fact, if we have ver somehow verified that the software has this property, satisfies this temporal logic formula, what does that tell us about the physical realization of the system? So we could say, well, all right, the naive answer number two is that the state is the physical ground truth of the physical system. But um, we, when, uh, you know, we again have to have this instantaneous shared time, uh, what Einstein called spooky action at a distance is in, in, in effect a way to get an instantaneous shared time where you can have physically separated actions that 
occur simultaneously in a causal way. Um, and uh, as uh, John Bell showed us, if we accept that that is possible, then we have to give up altogether on the notion of state. Uh, the system actually has no state. That's the, uh, the, what the physicists call reality, uh, the reality property. So, um, so this is problematic, not only in theory, but also in practice, because we really have this physically separated system where there's communication over networks and um, we don't have a way of mapping any verification result onto some physical reality of this system. So the, the third answer is, well, let's just forget about you know, the reality of, the, of modern physics. We'll just use Newton's fiction and it'll be close enough, right? That argument is, right, trains, at least in the US, they don't go anywhere near the speed of light, maybe in Europe, maybe in Asia, but uh, you know, not here. Um, so we don't have to worry about uh, relativity effects. And, and of course they're macroscopic objects. So all that stuff about quantum physics is baloney. Um, but that actually is a problematic perspective because precision matters whenever order matters. Okay, so let me pick a slightly more complicated example than the train door example, which is a, an aircraft door. So as you probably know, uh, aircraft doors are equipped with esca emergency escape slides. And when the door is armed, if you open the door, the slides deploy automatically. So the question is, should this door be disarmed before being opened or opened before being disarmed? Order relation, okay? When you have a dependence on an order relation like that, it really doesn't matter how small the timing error is. If the, if the door is opened before disarmed, the slides will deploy, no matter how small the time difference is. So if order matters, then you can't dismiss uh, the precision requirements, right? Newtonian, the Newtonian model of time and say, saying, ah, it's close enough, you know, I got it within, within 30 microseconds. It's not good enough um, if order matters. This has very practical consequences. So let's look at the state of the art way a distributed system gets defined today. So ROS, for example, the robot operating system, widely used in robotics scenarios, which are often safety critical systems. They're distributed systems where there's communication over networks and they use a publish and subscribe strategy where order doesn't matter, it's not preserved. So we can have, for example, let's elaborate a little bit on this aircraft door example. So in the aircraft door, we maybe have a cockpit control where the pilot can issue a disarm and an open message to the network. And those are going to um, go to the door. Obviously we're gonna want to preserve the ordering uh, of these uh, messages from the cockpit control and um, in a publish and subscribe framework, there's no assurance that that ordering will be preserved. But the system could be more elaborate. We could have, for example, an embedded vision system that uh, determines whether there is a ramp outside the door and always disarms the door whenever there's a ramp. We could have a fire detection system in the aircraft that when there's an, an emergency that's been detected, it opens the door, whether it's armed or not. It'll be relying on the embedded vision system to have determined that the door is at a ramp and not, so the slides won't get deployed. Uh, but the fire detection system doesn't know and it wants to open the door regardless of whether they're armed or not. Um, in this context, publish and subscribe simply will provide no assurances. And yet it's the mechanism that's widely used in robotics. MQTT is a publish and subscribe uh, framework that is widely used in Internet of Things applications. Azure and Google Cloud are public uh, publish and subscribe frameworks used in the cloud, and these provide no assurance of ordering. So you could say, okay, well, let's not use publish and subscribe. Let's use some other state-of-the-art system like an actor-based system uh, using message passing. Um, Erlang, for example, is widely used in safety-critical uh, embedded systems. Uh, but the actor model, uh, as originally defined by Hewitt and Aga, also provides no ordering assurances. The order in which messages are handled is non-deterministic. 
service-oriented architectures also have this property. Google's gRPC, uh, Thrift, Apache Thrift, uh, these are service-oriented architectures, which are essentially uh, abstractions of remote procedure calls, um, also provide no ordering assurance. So this ends up being a very practical problem. If we wanted to automate this aircraft door, we simply have no mechanism to do it. Um, the question becomes, can we verify that the door is disarmed before being opened if the disarm message is sent before the open message? And the problem is that even formalizing this statement becomes problematic in a distributed system without some definition of the state of the system. And in order to define the state of the system, we're going to have to define an observer. So the fact is that um, if you think of any of these component architectures, so publish and subscribe, for example, uh, ROS components, you could think of each component as an observer. It's able to observe certain parts of the state of the system. Unfortunately, um, the order of events in all of these frameworks will depend on the observer. So different components in the system will see different orderings of events. So there's no consistency in the order of events across the system. So if you try to formally verify any implementation of this aircraft door uh, system using any of these frameworks, your verification uh, result is gonna be very simple. The system is not safe. You have, you will, it will give you your counter examples and you will find that it's not safe. So you're just gonna have to, I guess, uh, keep the plane on the ground. By the way, I just learned this morning uh, that the FAA in the US has uh, authorized the Boeing 737 Maxes to begin flying again. So we have yet another reason not to fly uh, these days. Uh, as if we needed more reasons. But anyway, it, this is 20 months after they were grounded due to a design flaw in, um, in, in actually a flight envelope protection system. It was a system that was designed for safety to keep the plane from stalling uh, that was causing the, the failure that actually caused the plane to crash. Um, so how do we solve this problem? Well, I think that none of these distributed frameworks is going to be capable of solving the problem by itself. Um, the publish and subscribe, uh, uh, message passing, uh, and um, service-oriented architectures simply don't provide adequate levels of assurance about ordering or consistency of ordering across components in the system. So I've been working with this talented group of people towards a solution. Uh, we have a programming framework that we call Lingua Franca um, that is under development. It's a polyglot meta language. It's not really a programming language because the programming logic is written in your favorite language. It's currently, we, you can write the programming logic in C, C++, uh, Python, and TypeScript, which is a type safe version of JavaScript. And so those are the four languages that we have been working on so far. And um, the programming logic is written in those conventional languages, but Lingua Franca provides the orchestration of the components. And it's meant to be much more deterministic in even in a distributed execution setting uh, than any of these alternatives like, like uh, publish and subscribe frameworks and uh, service-oriented architectures. So here's what a Lingua Franca program looks like. You define components that we call reactors. So there's a controller, for example, this, um, this diagram here is synthesized automatically from the source code. Uh, this synthesis is done uh, by a research team in Kiel led by uh, Reinhard von Huxladen, who I think is one of the uh, world leading groups on uh, visualization. And they, these, these visualizations of these programs are really quite beautiful. Um, but in any case, uh, this diagram is generated from this code and the code defines a controller component, a door component and a train component. And these little cloud symbols indicate that it's a federated system, as you can see here, over here on line 30. It's a federated system, which means that you can map each of these components onto distinct hosts. 
and the code generator synthesizes the communication fabric and the orchestration fabric uh, for interaction between these components. And the components themselves have uh, state variables. So you can see the train component has a moving variable. The door component has a locked variable. And they also have inputs and outputs. So the controller in this case, for example, has a lock output and a move output. You can see those defined in the code right here. And these outputs uh, will send messages to these recipients. But there's a key property of Lingua Franca, which is missing in the publish and subscribe and in other actor-like frameworks, which is this global notion of logical time. This is a logical time, not a Newtonian time. It's not meant to be a physical time, although there are places where you want to align this logical time to physical time on a best effort basis. But logical time is a semantic property and it's a much, it's a, it's a property that you can use to build a formal model without relying on some formal model of a physical time, which is elusive in, in physics. So global logical time becomes a useful framework here because the messages that are communicated between components are time stamped and all messages throughout the system that are observed by any component are always observed in timestamp order. If two messages have two numerically identical timestamps, they will be observed simultaneously by the component. So um, by every component actually that can observe those two messages, they will be observed simultaneously. So we have a very clean notion of simultaneity. So in the aircraft door example, for example, if, if the disarm message and the open door message bear the same timestamp, then they will be handled by a single reaction that will see that both disarm and, um, and open door are present simultaneously. And presumably it would give preference to the disarm message. And so it will disarm the, the door before it's opened. If the timestamps are numerically ordered, then the ordering is semantically defined and the door will either be disarmed before it's open or not disarmed before it's open, depending on the timestamp. So this gives us a semantics to work with. Um, these little flag-like components are reactions and you can see the reactions here so this is the controller has a reaction to a startup event. And here this is abstracted away, but this would be code that's written in one of the target languages in C, C++ or, or, uh, or TypeScript or Python. Um, so those have been abstracted here, but you can see actually little snippets of C code here. So there's a, there's a piece of C code right there to change the state variable moving. Um, now, Lingua Franca also has a way of integrating these systems with the physical world. It doesn't, with this global notion of logical time, you could create something that is effectively just a self-contained simulation that has no interaction with the outside world. Um, but that's not gonna be very useful for deploying systems. So in Lingua Franca, we have a notion of a physical action and the physical action is often in an embedded system, it would be triggered by an interrupt Okay, in a, uh, in a cloud-based system, it would be triggered by a callback, a uh, callback function that is asynchronously invoked. And what happens with these physical actions is that when these physical actions occur, they get assigned a timestamp based on a local physical clock. And as a consequence, there, you have to have some reliance on clock synchronization for timestamps to have a global meaning. So if you know what the bound on the error is for clock synchronization. So if, a, if the train component is running on one platform and the controller component is running on a different platform and there's some effort put into synchronizing those clocks and you can say, well, the clocks are accurate uh, within, they're gonna, if you, were to able, if you were able to ask the two clocks simultaneously what time it, it is, they, they're, uh, the discrepancy has a bound say one millisecond for a fairly cl uh, coarse clock synchronization, one microsecond for a much tighter uh, clock synchronization, one second for a much looser, maybe you know, global internet scale clock synchronization using NTP or something like that. 
doesn't matter what the bound is, but you have to have some sort of bound in order for the timestamps assigned to these physical events to have a global meaning. So if a, one component assigns a timestamp to an external event based on its local clock and another component elsewhere in the system also assigns a timestamp to an event using its physical clock, those two timestamps have a meaning relative to one another as long as there is a bound on the clock synchronization error. Um, otherwise you lose that meaning. So distributed lingua franca programs become most useful in the context in contexts where there is some clock synchronization. Now, fortunately, clock synchronization is actually becoming quite ubiquitous. Um, it's certainly ubiquitous in uh, a lot of our IT infrastructure, which all pretty much all of it uses NTP, or if it has a GPS device, it synchronizes to GPS uh, clocks. Um, that's, that gives you a very high uh, degree of clock synchronization globally. Um, there's also very nice technologies called PTP for precision uh, time protocols for synchronizing clocks on, on networks. And that is starting to be uh, ubiquitously deployed. And certainly in the context of a, of a network on a train where there's a control system uh, running over that network, clock synchronization is going to be part of that network infrastructure. And consequently, you will be able to rely on some kind of a bound on clock synchronization error. So that gives us a mechanism by which we can now actually define a formalization of uh, the safety question of whether the, um, the, the door should be disarmed or, or, um, or opened first. So every component reacts to events in timestamp order. Timestamps have a global uh, total order relationship and as a consequence, every observer sees events in the same order, which is a consistency property that was missing in all of these distributed frameworks. So if we want to verify the system, um, that gets us only part of the way there, right? We still have to define a notion of state and we need a transition system model. How should we build a transition system model of such a program? I'm going to give you four different levels of transition system models that we could give. And you're going to see that the consequences of choosing between these are fairly profound. So let me start with the very simplest one, which is logical time semantics. So here we will define an observer not to be one of these software components at all, okay, but rather an external system like um, the mechanics of the train, okay, something outside the software, all right? And we're going to define, uh, design the hardware and the software so that such an observer can only see the state of the system at the conclusion of each logical time step, all right? So what that means is that if you have a logical time stamp where there are events, all components will process those events before any external observer can see any consequence of that processing. Okay, that's the, that's the way we're gonna design the system so that the entire system stabilizes its calculations at a logical time and then and only then can external effects occur. All right, in that case, if we can design the system that way, the verification problem becomes absolutely trivial for, for the train door example. So the train door example, we can synthesize a, a transition system. This is synth synthesized using, um, using timed Rebecca. Uh, and the transition system is really trivial. And you can just read here that in this state, the door is unlocked and the train is not moving. And in this state, the door is locked and the train is moving and the transitions, all possible transitions are shown. And as a consequence, this um, linear temporal logic formula is trivially satisfied and it will always be true. Uh, or it will always be false that you can't, you can't have the situation where the door is unlocked and the train is moving simultaneously. Okay, so we've trivialized the verification 
problem. And, you know, in a way, this is about the simplest verification scenario that one could in, imagine in a cyber physical system. So if we don't, if a trivial scenario doesn't result in a trivial verification problem, um, then we're probably, we probably don't have a very scalable technique. Now, it might be difficult to define uh, an observer this way, where the observer can only see the effects of the system after a logical time step has been completed globally. That requires kind of a global synchronization. So there has to be some kind of rendezvous point provided by the infrastructure that says, okay, all the components have stabilized now to this point, and now you, your external effects can, can take effect. Um, that might be difficult to implement, and it might be difficult to implement in a, in a fault tolerant way. And so you might want to go to a lower level semantics, uh, one that we call the event based semantics. And here it, we define an observer differently. We say an observer can only see the state of the system at the conclusion of each reaction. Okay, so a reaction is a chunk of code that gets invoked inside of a component in the system. And now we can fortunately assume an interleaving semantics for these reactions because in lingua franca, two of these software components, the train and the door, cannot share state variables. That's not allowed. As a consequence, their reactions can be executing simultaneously on different hardware, but there's no interaction between them. And consequently, we can build a transition system that assumes that they are actually executing in some order where this one executes before that one. And if they're actually executing simultaneously, it's simply a non-deterministic order, okay? And that assumption is safe because of the fact that these reactions don't share state variables. But we have to ensure that they don't share anything else either. So in particular, if the reaction, the body of the reaction is a piece of C code, and that C code is able to write to a memory map register that has some effect on the physical world. And another piece of C code is also able to affect the physical world. Then this interleaving semantics no longer works. Okay, you cannot assume that those two reactions are mutually atomic and that their concurrent execution is actually identical to their non-deterministic ordering. So, um, but if we make that assumption, and it, I, I'd like to emphasize that that assumption is codified in this definition of an observer. An observer can only see the state of the system at the conclusion of each reaction, okay? So it never observes the state of the system while a reaction is executing. Only after a reaction has con uh, concluded, actually it should be more precise. There should be no reaction executing when the observer observes the state. Okay, so in that case, um, it, with that definition of observer, we get, we can also synthesize a, a, a state transition diagram. So here is a state transition diagram for this train system example, and the verification becomes less trivial. And in fact, we find that there is a counterexample uh, to this uh, temporal logic formula, and we are going to have to elaborate the design now in order to uh, protect against this, okay? The counter example can be seen if I zoom in on this transition system, there's a non-deterministic transition here where we might go through a state where the door is unlocked and the train is moving, okay? And as a consequence of this counter example, we can elaborate the program doing more control over timing a little more handshaking in order to prevent this, uh, this uh, safety condition from being violated. So the point here is that um, the same system is safe and unsafe, depending on how you define the observer, okay? D depending on how you define the observer, you get a completely different definition of state and a completely different transition system model uh, for the same program. How do we choose between these? Okay, um, which which choice is right? Um, we could go even deeper. So I mentioned that if the body of a reaction is allowed to have effects in the physical world, then we may have to drop down into 
the body of the reactions and drop into a programming language semantics where we can define an observer based on modeling the operation of the body of reaction as a sequence of transitions where each transition is some atomic action in a programming language. Figuring out which actions are actually atomic in programming languages can be rather difficult, but nevertheless, uh, I mean, this community knows all about that problem. And then you simply non-deterministically interleave all those transitions, but you immediately have, even for this trivial problem, a state space explosion, okay? If these, if you have a body of a reaction that has any non-trivial number of, um, of atomic operations, you're gonna have an enormous state space, not something that you would ever wanna show on a PowerPoint slide. Um, and of course you could drop down to the physical world semantics and say, well, you know, you're, you, you need to model the sloshing of electrons in the microprocessors and in the network. And, um, you know, I, I don't think anyone here wants to go there. That's simply not gonna work. So the essential way that you have to understand the choice, let's, let's rule out dropping down to the programming language semantics and let's just consider these two higher level semantics, the logical time semantics or the event semantics. Which do we pick? These are both models. And what's the value of a model? Well, to a scientist, the value of a model lies in how well it matches the thing being modeled. At some level, both of these match the software pretty well, right? They actually are very accurate descriptions of the software. And so to some degree, this criterion doesn't help. It doesn't give us any guidance on how to choose between these models. What about the value of systems? So in this book uh, that Carlo mentioned, Plato and the Nerd, I point out that to an engineer, the value of a system lies in how well it matches the model. Okay, this is kind of like a mirror image of the scientist's perspective. It's, the scientist is, says the value of the model lies in how well it matches the system. The engineer says the value of the system lies in how well it matches the model. If we can build the system to match this logical time semantics, then we have a verifiable framework for des designing safety critical software that is much more scalable than if we're forced to use this semantics where the state space is immediately much bigger for a trivial problem. And of course it gets enormously bigger for less trivial problems. So the question here isn't which model is more faithful to the physical realization. It's which physical realization is more faithful to the model. That's the question that we need to address. Now, this logical time-based semantics is actually potentially realizable. I, so without further assumptions, you know, these transition systems really don't match the distributed cyber physical system well at all. And if you don't have further assumptions about the realization, of the system, then um, just knowing the software doesn't really help. Now, you know, George Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, another take on this question, um, all system realizations are wrong, but some are useful. Every system realization, no matter how faithful we try to make it to some model is never perfect. So both this scientific view of modeling and this engineering view of modeling have a gap. To a scientist, the scientific model needs to match the physical system, but it never matches it perfectly. That's what George Box says. To the engineer, the physical system needs to match the model, but it never matches it perfectly. There's always a gap. That's a reality. Okay, but by making that gap smaller, you make systems safer. That's the, that's the goal. So the twist here is that instead of trying to make the model match the system, we try to make the system match the model. Now, how do we do that with the logical time-based semantics? Well, 
there's actually precedent for this, a very old technology dating back to the 1980s, programmable logic controllers. It's actually one of the more amazingly persistent technologies in electronics and software because it's largely an unchanged technology since the 1980s. It has incredible durability and it's still a, a thriving business. Programmable logic controllers are widely used in industrial automation and they have this property that an observer can only see the state of the system at the conclusion of each logical time step. So a piece of software application code in a programmable logic controller doesn't control physical devices directly. It writes data into a buffer memory and then the core system, the programmable logic, the PLC operating system takes over. And when a logical time step is complete, it then actuates the physical world with the final state of what's in that buffer memory. And as a consequence, the, all of the software components reach a stable point and then actuation occurs. So this is an existence proof that we can actually design systems for verifiability but we have to get down into the details. So this design for verifiability is sort of my key message here. Um, you need to design the hardware, the software and your network so that any observer, which is in some external system sees only what you want it to see. Uh, you get to choose what that is, right? If, if you make it the states at the conclusion of each time step, that's going to give you an, a very nicely verifiable system. If you make it uh, the states at the conclusion of each reaction, it's still gonna be verifiable, um, but it's gonna have a bigger state space and there's more flexibility in the implementation, um, looser synchronization, um, more possibilities for fault tolerance. So those are the kind of trade-offs that you need to be able to address. Um, if you do it right, you end up with trivial verification problems, um, but it may be too expensive to do it this way or not fault tolerant enough or so these trade-offs have to be evaluated. Uh, but the way that you evaluate them is by choosing your notion of state and choosing your notion of observer. So in conclusion, the observer problem, the notion of state is a model, not a fact. It has no grounding in physics. In fact, modern physics tells us that it's a very problematic idea um, and it may not be part of reality at all. Um, you have no transition system until you have a notion of state and you have no notion of state until you've de defined your observer. And the choice of observer profoundly, profoundly impacts the verifiability of your system. So thank you very much. With that, I would like to open this up to questions. And thank you very much, Edward, for a very, very interesting and very thought-provoking talk. So if uh, there's any questions from the public, uh, please use the Q and A section so that I can relay them to the speaker. Um, maybe I can get started with a couple of questions that I also have. Um, so, uh, about the, the, the kind of like this uh, message of design for verifiability, this is uh, uh, very uh, convincing, I, I find it very convincing, uh, but at the same time I was also thinking that uh, uh, there are situations where uh, you don't have uh, any chance of uh, changing the system. So the system is existing, it's maybe a legacy system, uh, and uh, so you just have to work your way around the, the all the kinks and all the uh, strange features of the system. So I wonder though if your uh, um, general approach and general ideas can also have some uh, um, use uh, in this context where you're you're not allowed to to design from scratch, but you are uh, uh, constrained by something that is already existing. Yeah, that's a that's a very challenging scenario. I mean, fortunately, in many cases where you have um, safety critical systems like in industrial automation or in avionics, there are actually pretty strong principles underlying the design of the system, which helps in even verifying legacy systems. So for example, in, in avionics systems, in order to be able to certify software for use in, in uh, 
commercial flight control systems, um, you're not allowed to use interrupts, which means that I want to point out that rules out all modern operating systems, all modern uh, um, networking technologies, except domain specific networks, um, right. which I mean, operating systems and networking rely absolutely on on interrupt driven mechanisms for um, for handling interactions. And so these are designed in a very constrained framework. Um, PLCs, I think that, I, you know, these programmable logic controllers, the part of the reason that they're such a durable technology, even though they're really astonishingly old, um, is that they're a very constrained uh, programming environment, that the software that you can construct in there is, is really very constrained. And my, my colleague, Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli, you know, famously describes this as freedom from choice, right? That if you have a more constrained design framework, uh, you have fewer ch choices to make and fewer ways to hang yourself. And so sometimes these legacy systems are, are more verifiable than they might be otherwise, simply because they've been designed in these more constrained frameworks. Unfortunately, a lot of what we're seeing today in, in the context of self-driving cars, for example, um, these are being designed using, you know, essentially technologies that were developed for, for information processing, not for cyber physical systems. Um, I don't think they're going to be verifiable. A lot of people are very worried about, you know, the aspect of verifying systems that integrate AIs. I don't even think you have to integrate AIs. I think they're unverifiable as soon as they're just a bunch of, you know, threads running under Linux, uh, interacting using mutexes, um, you're already screwed. And so ensuring safety of those systems, I think is going to be extremely challenging. All right. Thank you. So I think we have a question from Wolfgang. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for your very, very nice talk, Wolfgang Arendt, Thomas University. I was wondering about the compositionality of, of your approach. Um, uh, it, it looks like you, you construct a kind of global automaton, if I may say, but I'm not, not sure I should even call it like that. Um, uh, wh whereas I, I, which is fine, but, but I think that your assumption that, uh, that, uh, that all if, that effects are only triggered once all inputs are processed, I think that would allow for also nice compositional verification. Um, do you yeah. understand my question? Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I don't have an answer for you, but I am extremely optimistic that the resulting verification techniques uh, that leverage um, this global logical time will be more compositional. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, one of my current PhD students, his entire research is focusing on this problem of uh, how do you take advantage of this logical notion of time in verification and compositionality is certainly one of the opportunities there. So that's a very good point. Okay, thank you very much. Just just a little uh, follow up, uh, or if it's a follow up. Uh, uh, what do you think? Will the straight state transition in the White House be Newton style or Milner style? <laughs> um, I hope it'll be Milner style. Um, but to be honest, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, then there is a question from uh, Thomas Santen. Um, thanks for a very interesting talk. Would time trigger architecture also work as a platform instead of uh, uh, PLCs? Yes, absolutely. Uh, time triggered architectures are uh, um, ha also have extremely nice properties uh, in that they, they build in a synchronization mechanism into the network and uh, it enables a much tighter coordination and also similar gating of impacts on the outside world. Definitely. Um, they do require um, infrastructure in the network. There are uh, variants of these that uh, require less infrastructure that rely on, on PTP, the precision time protocols for clock synchronization. So you can get the effects of a time-triggered architecture by, by first just synchronizing clocks 
and then using those synchronized clocks to regulate your actions. Um, and that requires less networking infrastructure because these BTP protocols can run over ordinary ethernet and TCP IP. So any more questions from the public? I can ask another question in the meanwhile. Uh, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, all right, I'll try, okay. Uh, so my question is, um, I'm trying to relate what you are doing with what uh, fault tolerant distributed systems community have been doing for ages. with different model of uh, group membership, reliable communication, uh, how these worlds are going to evolve. Are they just parallel strands which are never going to talk to each other or you feel some uh, use in what has been done there? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. There's a, there's a, there's a wealth of work in the in the uh, fault tolerant design community that I think would be uh, very directly applicable in this context. I see it as somewhat orthogonal, though. Um, I mean, in in a, in a way, what we're doing is defining a, a semantics, okay? And your your goal is to preserve that semantics, right? But it's the definition of the semantics that we're focused on. Right. And the basic mechanisms by which you can guarantee that the semantics are met um, does require, of course, drawing from fault tolerant, the fault tolerant community. So, so to give you a concrete example, um, one of the ways that you could uh, ensure that time stamped events are handled globally in order is to have a centralized controller that every um, participant has to consult before advancing its notion of logical time. So the centralized controller would, would guarantee that to the component that it has received all messages uh, time stamped up to a certain point. And then it, it, so the centralized controller tells it, you've received all the messages up to, up to this timestamp, so you can go ahead and process your messages that are time stamped up to this. But that centralized controller becomes a single point of failure, which is not a good idea, right? And so we have been leveraging a technique that uh, that we first introduced in 2007 that we call Tides, uh, that was subsequently independently reinvented at Google and has been applied in Google Spanner, which is a global uh, replicated database uh, that Google uses that uh, coordinates the execution, the handling of timestamped events in a completely decentralized way. And it ensures that if any component fails, that component's failure to send timestamped messages does not block any other component from advancing its notion of logical time. Okay, so that's a key criterion that you need for fault tolerance. If any component drops out of the network, it shouldn't be able to bring down other components. And that is a property of this, uh, of this tides mechanism. Uh, of course, the, the semantics of your program changes when you have a component that fails, right? And so you want to be able to detect those failures. And one of the nice things about tides is that it does provide mechanisms for detecting uh, failures and violations of assumptions. Um, and then you can build, build in, you know, uh, logic into your programs that reacts to these detections in a, in a, as a way of handling faults. Yeah, but there is a there's a wealth of work to draw on there. Absolutely, you're right. Yes, thank you. We have another question from the attendees. So, uh, what is the largest state space size? Uh, uh, I think I think this was tested by Lingua Franca. Well, Lingua, Lingua Franca is a, is still at a pretty early stage, and um, we're, you know, the the programs that we've built so far are, are benchmarks from the actor world and a very large number of relatively small regression test cases and one or two simple applications, but nothing big enough to stress the, the uh, scalability of, um, of the verification methods. We're just not there yet. Maybe I would like to ask one more question. So I was curious, uh, I think in the presentation, 
uh, I don't think you had any examples uh, along this line, but I was wondering if uh, in the framework, in the Lingua Franca framework, you also have a way of providing some guarantees uh, that have to do with uh, enforcing uh, uh, liveness properties. So like, for example, event or delivery of messages or uh, uh, even time bounded delivery, something like that. Um, so in the, in the Tides framework that I just described, um, it doesn't provide an enforcement mechanism, but it makes an assumption about bounded uh, latency uh, for message deliveries. So the, the Tides distributed coordination will fail to handle messages in timestamped order if latencies exceed a, a predefined threshold, okay? It's a detectable violation, right? So if a message arrives out of timestamp order, um, then uh, the component that receives it knows that one of the assumptions was violated. And it, it, it turns out it's actually network latency is fundamentally indistinguishable from clock synchronization error. You can, you can actually prove there's no way to tell the difference uh, between network latency and clock synchronization error, but we assume bounds on both. And if you receive messages out of timestamp order, then you know that the bound was violated. Um, one of the things that, that we have been experimenting with is actually learning it, as part of the execution of the program, learning what those bounds should be and adjusting on the fly the execution policy in the program. And of course, you want to do that subject to uh, safety constraints. So things like deadlines. Uh, so we have deadlines in Lingua Franca and we those deadlines get affected by, by the adjustments that you make your ability to meet these deadlines gets affected by your your on the fly adjustments of these uh, uh, of these assumed bounds on network latency, but that's an ongoing uh, area of of research. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered the question. Yeah, yeah, kind of a big area, but it's related to that closely related. Yes. So let's see if there are any more questions from anyone. So it doesn't look like so. So we are uh, just on time to close this uh, session. So thank you very much again, Edward, for a very, uh, very broad uh, and uh, inspiring talk. And I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. And this concludes the second day of IFM. So uh, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, I'll see everybody again tomorrow. Thank you, Carlo. And thank, thank you, you, everyone else. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.